Mr. President, off and on for some time, I've come to the floor to speak about an issue that doesn't receive a lot of attention, and it's the issue of political prisoners in foreign lands, journalists in Cameroon, an AIDS activist in Uzbekistan, and a lot of others. Sadly, there's no shortage of political prisoners in this world. They languish in horrible prisons in places like Iran and North Korea. Today, I want to focus on a number of them, and I preface my remarks by apologizing for mispronouncing names. Some of these are extremely difficult names for an American to pronounce, particularly one from the Midwest. I suppose one might start typically with the most outrageous case, but tragically, all of the cases that I'll speak to fit that definition. Let me start with a heartbreaking case from six years ago, that of Gambian journalist Ebrima Manet. Manet was a reporter for the Daily Observer, a newspaper where, who, where he allegedly um, was detained by plain-clothed clothed Gambian security officials. He was held incommunicado for years, although he was seen during the initial years of his detention by witnesses in at least one detention facility and hospital. No one has seen him for years. It is possible that he died in custody. But just imagine the pain and uncertainty of his family who have no help and no answers. The economic community of West African states, Court of Justice, which has jurisdiction over Gambia, and the United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention both ruled against the Gambian government on their case and called for his release. After years of waiting, the Gambian government recently requested United Nations help to investigate Mane's case and the death of one of the journalists. This was a welcome move by the Gambian government, and I hope that ongoing discussions with the United Nations will expedite the investigation, bring some resolution to the case and answers to Mane's family. Mr. President, some years ago there was a change in leadership in Turkmenistan, one that many hoped would open that country's closed and repressive political system. Unfortunately, President Berde Mukam Madoff has yet to meet those modest expectations. You'd think in a country where the president wins an election with 97% vote and where there's an annual week of happiness, the Turkmen leadership could be more gracious to its political opponents. Unfortunately, the following examples demonstrate just the opposite. Golgadi Anyazov is a longtime political dis dissident who left Turkmenistan in 2000 to settle in Norway as a political refugee. He reportedly returned to Turkmenistan in June 2008 to visit his family and was arrested. After a closed trial on October 7th, sentenced to 11 years in prison, Anur Karban Amanklechev here and Saperdi Kadziev are members of the human rights organization Turkmenistan Helsinki Foundation. They were convicted in August 2006 after trials of only two hours and sentenced to six and seven years in jail on charges that were never very clear. Unfortunately, we don't have a photograph of Mr. Kadziev. Turkmen government officials have been quoted as asserting that these individuals were arrested and convicted for, quote, gathering slanderous information to spread public discontent end of quote. The legal bases for their detention are suspect at best and raise serious concerns of political intimidation, questionable charges, closed trials, and inappropriately punitive punishment. In May 2010, more than 20 senators, and that's not an easy feat in the Senate, signed a letter to Secretary of State Clinton urging the administration to raise these cases with the Turkmenistan leadership. I know the State Department did in fact take those steps. I thank them, but I hope they'll continue. In November 2010, the United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention released its opinion that the arrest and continued detention of the Turkmenistan Helsinki Foundation members was arbitrary and in violation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. That United Nations group called on the Turkmen government to immediately release them. Sadly, they continue to languish under harsh sentences that include hard labor, torture, and forced psychotropic drug injections. To the leaders of Turkmenistan, I say if you really want to change the image of your nation in the world, you must release these and other political prisoners. Mr. President, it's hard to believe that in Europe there's still one regime like that of Alexander Lukashenko. 
He's often known as the last dictator of Europe. Now, I've been to Belarus twice, once with the Helsinki Commission group, led by Senator Cardin of Maryland, where we actually met this president, Lukashenko. Most recently, I went there after a highly suspect 2010 uh, election held in December. What was egregious about this election was that President Lukashenko, on the night of the election, beat up and arrested all the candidates who had the nerve to run against him, as well as hundreds of Belarusian citizens who showed up in central Minsk to protest his actions. Lukashenko's barbaric behavior and that of his KGB henchmen, and that's right, Belarus still has something called a KGB, earned him sweeping condemnation from Europe and the United States, isolating his nation and hurting his own people. <clears throat> this photograph, sadly today, a year and a half after his, this outrage, Lukashenko is still holding this man, this presidential candidate, Mikhaili Statkevich, who was sentenced to six years in medium security prison for having the nerve to run against Lukashenko. At least six and as many thir as 13 other protesters from the election still sit in jail. This is outrageous in Europe today, or anywhere on the planet for that matter. It's time for President Lukashenko to let this man and these people go. <clears throat> Next, Mr. President, I turn to Vietnam. Although our bilateral relationship continues to improve with Vietnam, we cannot ignore the troubling disregard for freedom of speech in that country. It's illustrated by the unfounded detention of a popular blogger, Nguyen Van He, known as Duque. Let me show you this photograph of him. He's the head of the Free Vietnamese Journalist Club, and as such, K has been detained almost continuously by Vietnamese authorities since 2008, when he was convicted and tried for trumped up tax evasion charges. In 2009, the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention highlighted Kay's case, as well as the illegal arrest and continued persecution of a number of other internet bloggers. In October 2010, on the day Kay was due to be released, having fulfilled a sentence, he was transferred to a new jail, rearrested for violating a security provision that pro prohibits propagandizing against the government. The propaganda in question? A three-year-old blog posting. The subject of his propaganda? freedom of speech and other issues considered by the government to be too sensitive, just as labor strikes in the trials of two human rights lawyers. Kay's arrest is part of a well-documented trend in Vietnam in which national security concerns have been cited as a pretext for arrest and criminal investigation. The State Department's Human Rights Report notes that the Vietnamese government is increasing suppression of dissent, increasing measures to limit freedom of the press, speech, assembly, and association, and increasing restrictions on internet freedom. The trend is clear and very concerning. Secretary Clinton noted in a speech last year on internet rights and wrongs, quote, in Vietnam, bloggers who criticize the government are arrested and abused, end of quote. It's long overdue that Vietnamese leaders release Mr. K and stop harassing journalists and bloggers. Lastly, Mr. President, Saudi Arabia, our ally on many, many important issues, but also a friend with whom we have vast differences when it comes to basic freedoms and women's rights. Let me tell a recent story that is truly hard to believe. Since early 2012, the Saudi government has imprisoned 23-year-old blogger Hamza Kashgari. His crime? He tweeted an imaginary conversation with the Prophet Muhammad. That action sparked a spate of death threats, causing him to remove the tweet and flee to New Zealand in fear of his life. While stopping in Malaysia for a plane transfer, Malaysian tr authorities detained him until the, their Saudi counterparts swooped in and returned him to Saudi Arabia under arrest. Back in the kingdom, facing accusations of blasphemy and calls for his execution by top clerics, he repented before the Saudi court and showed great remorse, asking for forgiveness. That was four months ago, yet he remains imprisoned, awaiting his fate, with no sense of when a decision will be made. I can imagine his actions sparking a debate in Saudi Arabia, but leading to calls for a death sentence for blasphemy in today's world, that is hard to believe. 
Saudi Arabia has initiated steps towards social, educational, judicial, and economic reform. We encourage them to do more. Immediately flee freeing Mr. Kashgari would be an important move. This man has suffered enough and deserves his freedom now. Mr. President, these are just a sample of the many political prisoners that still suffer in parts of the world. I want them and their families and the governments that unjustly imprisoned them to know that they are not forgotten. I and my colleagues here in the Senate will continue to do our best to draw attention to their plight, work for their release, and stand up for the cause of human rights in the United States and around the world.